10 kids, right, in their childhood at some point has a food allergy. And what we know is that it's likely a combination of things. You are listening to Veggie Doctor Radio, and this is episode number 168. Welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am your host, Dr. Yami, board certified pediatrician, certified lifestyle medicine physician, certified health and wellness coach, author, speaker, mother, wife, and human being. I passionately believe in the power of diet, habits, and mindset in sparking and sustaining well being and joy in our lives. This podcast combines expert interviews and thoughtful monologues to explore plant-based nutrition, lifestyle medicine, parenting, mindset, and other exciting and fun topics. I hope that these episodes inspire you, uplift you, and equip you with the knowledge and tools to live your best life. Are you ready to get started? Let's do it. Hello, hello, veggie lovers. Welcome back to another episode of Veggie Doctor Radio, this time with the amazing Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson. We are going to talk about food allergies again. Dr. Swanson is the chief medical officer at Spoonful One, and she is dedicating her life right now to educating parents about preventing food allergies. If you've been following me for a while and you've been listening to my episodes, you probably have heard episodes 82 with Dr. David Stukas and episode 83 with Dr. Manisha Raylan. They are both pediatric allergists and we talk about this topic on their episodes as well, but we cover even more broad topics on those episodes. On this episode with Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson, We're going to focus just on pediatric food allergy prevention, talk about the company that she is chief medical officer of currently, Spoonful One, what they do, what they provide. But I love this conversation because Dr. Swanson is telling us that the diversity of food exposure is so important. Now, I want to remind you that yes, in the top allergens in our country, A lot of those are animal products, but when it comes to food diversity, please don't forget that there's over 50,000, 50,000, five zero edible plants in the world. So true diversity is actually coming from whole plant foods. But if you're a parent of a vegan or vegetarian baby, you want to consider exposure to some of these animal products. Now, it may be uncomfortable to even think about these things, but I want you to have the information so that you can make an educated, informed decision. So in this episode, we're going to talk about food allergy prevention, when to introduce complementary foods and allergens, what the most important things are to think about when you start introducing those foods, But we also talk about the five D's when it comes to modern susceptibility of food allergies, which I hadn't actually heard this before. It's super, super fascinating. So you're going to get a lot out of this podcast episode. Just to tell you a little bit more about Dr. Swanson, she is a pediatrician mother of two, chief medical officer at Spoonful One, and she has dedicated her career to pediatric prevention efforts and works to educate parents and the medical community about reducing food allergy risk. Veggie lovers, thank you so much for being here with me. I appreciate you so much. If you have a moment, leave me a review, please. Share this episode, please. Let's get the word out so that other people can also have this free education at their fingertips. I hope that you have a very plantastic day and let's welcome Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson to the show. Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson, welcome to Veggie Doctor Radio. I am 
thrilled to pick your brain and learn all of the things you've been learning over the past four years. So tell me, first of all, how and why did you become so passionate about pediatric food allergy prevention? Yeah, thanks. Well, first off, it's great to be here. Um, I eat all sorts of things besides veggies, so I bet you're going to help me understand how to go towards your way. But I'll, I'll tell you, I'm <laughs> You know, as a pediatrician and mom and someone who's invested my career at trying to move things along faster for families, uh, it became very clear to me that there was new data out in the world uh, that all families really needed access to. And mm -hmm. so when I met Dr. Kari Nadeau, uh, who runs the Allergy Center at Stanford University, she's a medical doctor. She's also a PhD protein biochemist. And hmm. when I met her and learned about the science that she had really unfolded and articulated at Stanford that kids in early life had a unique period of time that when they fed on all different kinds of foods, their immune system was changed and they hmm. likely were going to grow up less likely to develop things like food allergy, for example. Hmm. When, when I saw that and it was so antithetic or the opposite of what you know you and I when we went through our training as pediatricians were told to do I recognize that there's this huge translational gap and that's that's the kind of work I love the most in pediatrics mm -hmm. and so that is what really drew me to helping families around the world and here specifically in the United States understand the data find realistic approachable solutions to feeding their babies with confidence and also really help guide and change where the food source was going and you know we all as pediatricians love prevention I mean that's why we're pediatricians it's the beginning yes. of life we know if we do things well early you get these long downstream effects right um, mm -hmm. and I think increasingly as I get older and I'm a more experienced pediatrician mom human being we start to recognize the value of things like sleep the value of, of being outside and the value of how we feed our bodies and the kind of profundity of what that does to health and in not a gimmicky way but in a meaningful way that scientifically from pediatric advice to even parenting advice the kinds of habits that we create in early life um, will potentially dramatically change lives and yes. that's how i got here wow you're speaking my language i love it so beautiful well let's take a step back and how did we get to the place that we were to begin with because you're right it has been a dramatic shift mm -hmm. when we were telling people be very afraid. Mm -hmm. Don't feed your baby anything. Start with rice cereal. Go super slow. It, it, everybody's just scared to feed their babies. How did we get there? Yeah, I think we got to rewind. So I'm, you know, I'm in my late, late-ish now, ah, 40s. Um, so I was, I was born in the 70s. Went to school in the 80s. You know, when I went to school in the 80s, there wasn't a peanut-free table. In fact, I don't remember ha knowing or having any friends or contacts in sports and my music program and anywhere I went as a child. I don't remember having children around me with food allergies. Each of the decades from then on, 80s, 90s, 90s to 2000, 2000 to 2010, 2010 to 2020, we know that food allergies here in the United States and around the world have doubled each one of those decades. Mm -hmm. So part of how we've gotten here is that in the 80s and 90s and up into the year 2000, there was a reckoning in some ways that pediatricians and allergists were having that food allergies were rising at a rate that was not explainable by genetics. And something was changing likely in our environment. Um, and so allergists came to a consensus that said, wait a second, we know there are typical foods that are, are common allergens, things that lots of people know, right? We hear a lot about peanut allergy. We hear a lot about tree nut allergy. We hear about dairy allergy. We hear about egg allergy. We hear about soy and sesame, for example, a rising allergen here in the United States, now kind of, you know, the ninth most common. And I think in around the year 2000, the allergists sat together in a table, truly in a room, and the American Academy of Pediatrics put out a guideline that said, wait, allergies are out of control. They're rising at a rate that is unprecedented. We need to take these out of early life because babies and toddlers were starting to develop common allergies specifically to things like peanut and egg mm -hmm. and dairy. And so the academy said, to, like I was coming through medical school at that time, finishing my medical training, and the guidance was no peanut till three, no egg until two, no dairy till one. And the goal was to avoid those exposures in early life. And the hope was we would curb this rise in food allergy and reverse it. 
And of course, unfortunately, families thankfully now know that the, the end of that story is that was the exact wrong thing to do. The data didn't necessarily point in that direction, but because it was happening without a lot of explanation pathophysiologically, we did it. And then food allergies didn't only not turn around, but they continued to rise. And so we are left today, right, with 6 million children in the United States with a food allergy. That's about 8% of United States children. And putting that in context, and I think it's really important, those are just numbers, right? Those seem like somebody else's kid. But the reality of that number is that that's two children in every American classroom on average that now has, a, you know, an IgE-mediated or physician-diagnosed food allergy. And there's something, you know, the, the way we got here, and not to be so long-winded, but the way we got here is that there's likely a modern susceptibility. So it isn't just that we took foods out of the diet in early life, because before we did that, they were already rising. But we know there's something about the industrialized worlds that we live in. You know, 10% of Australian children, for example, have a food allergy, even higher than here in the United States. In China, for example, 9 to 10% of children, right? Around Europe, there are different pockets and, and, different, and different numbers. But, but we're all, it's, you know, almost 1 in 10 kids, right, in their childhood at some point has a food allergy. And what we know is that it's likely a combination of things, a lack of vitamin D, because we do a good job with sunscreen as well we should. We don't get as much vitamin D. We are not maybe getting as much in our diet. We're overusing antibiotics. So, you know, um, when we overuse antibiotics, we kill off all that good bacteria. We, we don't have as dense. And, and prolific of a microbiome. Um, and dry skin in the industrialized world is a risk factor. So the common, and you know, most of us use like high efficiency detergents. They, they tend to actually be very damaging to our skin. They sit in there, our clothes are impregnated with those detergents. They sit on our skin, they break down our skin. And then we are exposed to the world in a different way because our skin, the largest organ of our body, right, is our, it's our protector. It's our leather. It's around us, right? It, it takes care of us that way. And when we're using things and products and even detergents, for example, um, we, we break down the skin and you've got these little micro, micro openings. And, and what we know, and we'll get to the data that's really changed everything, is that when you're exposed to food through your skin, it tends to be a somewhat sensitizing process. Meaning that if, if my baby is, you don't want your babies to first learn about peanut through their skin or walnut through their skin or egg through their skin uh, from your hands or from something in the environment. You want their immune system is set up to learn about food in their tummy, in their gut. 70% of our immune system is in our tummy. And, and so we want food to be in there. But that, the, the, going back to like, why are we here? The modern susceptibility, some people call the five Ds, this concept of diet diversity. We don't have it as much anymore. Um, dry skin, the dry skin from detergents or just eczema as a risk factor, for example, is a risk factor for developing allergies. Drool, a lack of drool and dirt. So those are the couple more Ds. And that means like, for example, there's great data that if you raise your children in a home where there are pets like dogs who go outside and play in the dirt and come back in and bring fungus and bacteria and gunk from the yard, it's good for your kid from an allergic standpoint. They tend to be less likely to develop food allergy, eczema, allergies, asthma later in life. Um, and then the last one is vitamin D, that vitamin D is an immune mod modulator. And that when you don't have enough vitamin D around, we think that on some level, that's just another reason of why you might be a somewhat predisposed and at a population level, that might be part of it. And when you think of Australia as the number one place for food allergies in children, you know, there's a hole in the ozone in Australia. Australia has mm -hmm. done an amazing job with public health campaigns to get people to wear sunscreen. And when they're wearing all that sunscreen, they're not getting as much natural vitamin D conversion from sunlight. And so, you know, we have to eat that vitamin D as well. So that modern susceptibility is kind of how we got here. And so in the long story short, back to 2000 when we took them all out. Then in 2008, the Academy of Pediatrics said, um, nope, <laughs> don't do that. And then in 2015, and you know this, you know, a, a very famous study was published called the LEAP trial, which changed everything on its head, which really found that actually keeping it out of the diet, yeah, we knew that wasn't good in 2008. But in 2015, when Dr. Gideon Lack published the LEAP trial and found ultimately that if you feed peanut, not just once and not just early, but as young as four to, four to six months of age in a kid at high risk for food allergy, but you feed it three times a week all the way through infancy, all the way through childhood, all the way through preschool years, when that kid goes off to, to kindergarten, they're going to be 80% less likely to develop a peanut allergy in the first place. And that's turned everything upside down. That, in fact, the immune system wants to know food in its tummy. It wants to learn about it, but over and over and over and over and over again while a child is growing up. 
Wow. Oh my goodness. That is such great information. I love the five D's. That's amazing. And I imagine Australia, there's parts of Australia that are also very dry. And so that probably increases susceptibility to eczema and dry skin, opening that skin barrier. I know here in Yakima, it's very dry here. So eczema is one of the just commonalities of living here. So it's really good to know that one of the things we need to focus on is protecting that skin barrier, keeping it intact. That's yeah, and beautiful. probably all throughout our lives. I mean, it's interesting. You know, when I was, I practiced general pediatrics in Seattle, as you know, for 12 years. And I think we, I always used to be so much with families. I'd be like, less is more. Like, you know, put, don't put anything on your baby. Like, leave your baby's skin alone. Like, you know, use a tiny dime-sized amount of soap and only use it once a week. But now we're starting to recognize and realize, right, that keeping that baby soft skin is actually in your baby's best interest because of exactly mm -hmm. this. And it's not just, um, it's not just environment. In fact, you know, we are there's something called the filigree gene, for example, that is inherited. And some of us inherit eczema. I had eczema as a child. My first son had eczema as a child. I mean, part of it is, yeah, we put good emollients on our baby's skin. We don't overbathe them, et cetera. But there is part of it that is genetic in that regard. But it's just predisposition. So it's like. We, we have to act differently because of it. Um, yes. So, you know, sometimes it's just bad luck that you get a kid who's really sensitive and a, what we call atopic um, or eczematous or really dry patches. And sometimes it happens because we do over dry a baby's skin. But both, mm -hmm. to your point, at, at any time in life, you know, our founder, Dr. Carne Doe, with, you know, I work with Spoonful One and, you know, she's, she's so bright, but she washes her clothes with baking soda. She doesn't use detergents because now that she understands, right, that we don't know, we don't have a prevention strategy for food allergies in adulthood. We know that 50% of food allergies are diagnosed in adulthood. That was a study published mm -hmm. in the New England Journal of Medicine a couple of years ago in 2019. And I think, you know, we don't have a prevention strategy there, but we certainly recognize that maybe who we are and how we live on the planet might be changing that susceptibility too. So we can all take good care of our skin in all sorts of ways. Absolutely. Oh, that's so good. So let's delve into what are, what you believe should be the record. I, I know we've changed with the LEAP trial, we've changed how we introduce allergens, but you know, as most things that change when it comes to policies or evidence, it kind of permeates slowly, right? So I think that there's right. still some thought, there's still fear around introducing allergies. So what currently are the recommendations about introducing complementary foods and common allergens to babies? Yeah, I mean, thanks, Dr. Yami. I think one thing that's really important here is recognizing that it can take a long time from the kind of scientific truth to be unfolded to the time mm -hmm. when every clinician from California to Iowa to Tennessee is saying the same thing. And that was right. exactly why I joined. I left Seattle Children's. You know, I left kind of an, an academic. I was a, a chief, you know, chief of digital innovation there, and moved to help this little company translate and bring kind of different foods to the home because it can take so long to change, particularly when it when it reverses. So, in the year two thousand, like I told you, we took these. We said, take these out of the baby's diets. Then in the year 2008, that neutralized, but nobody really changed their behavior. I was practicing in 2008 in Seattle, and I think I was still encouraging families to leave some of these foods and go really slow. It's an easy piece of advice to give. It's like, oh, mm. go slow, take your time, watch really closely, as opposed to what we now know is beneficial. After the LEAP trial that we talked about with Peanut, there was another study called the EAT trial in 2016, also published in the very respected New England Journal of Medicine. And it looked at feeding five to six foods in early life as early as three months of Asian breastfed babies. And what we found is that it was hard for moms and dads to get five different common allergens in their baby's diet routinely. But those who did, did see protection against, for example, peanut and egg allergy. And so mm -hmm. that opened all, kind of all this up. But the, the, the guidelines kind of continued to change slowly. In 2017, the kind of, you know, allergy councils and societies here said, okay, we're going to give you really crisp guideline about peanut. But they did it with eczema babies versus non-eczema babies and made it really complicated yeah. in some ways. But we're like, yeah. get it in early. Don't wait. But they didn't follow up by saying, and keep it in the diet. But one of the most important things here is that all the studies that have found the value of feeding your babies these kinds of foods early in life required months to years of feeding the food. Meaning it isn't like, oh, you feed your baby um, walnut, you know, in, in mixed up in some kind of yummy food at, when they're eight months of age. And then that's that. No. In fact, you want tree nuts and peanuts and maybe shrimp and fish and egg and wheat and soy. All that beautiful diet diversity we want you to eat all throughout your life. Um, we want that to be in the diet over and over again while that immune system is learning and changing and growing. So it's almost like you're exercising it. You're saying, 
putting it in the baby's tummy and then the, the immune system in the tummy is saying, oh, there's, there's peanut. Oh, there's cashew. Oh, wait, there's soy. Oh, wait, there's egg. Um, and, and with constant ongoing exposure, you, you kind of generate that tolerance. But I think most notable is that we get, we get, we're a little stuck in medicine where we, we want to wait for perfect data in part because they made the mistake in 2000 to give the wrong advice. And so, but you're never going to have what's called the leap trial. Like we talked about with peanut on every single food protein. It's just never going to happen. It was a 20 to $30 million trial. You're never going to be able to say, okay, I'm going to do a, another trial on walnut. And then I'm going to go do a $20 million study on shrimp. And then I'm going to go do a $20 million study on fish. I mean, the immune system is the immune system is the immune system in some way. It's very specific in that you can't feed peanut early in life and protect against the development of a fish allergy. You have to feed fish protein because the immune system locks mm -hmm. onto that little part of the fish protein mm -hmm. and, it, and it learns and knows it. So the immune system is protein specific. But what's I think most notable is that in the end of 2020, you know, right in the middle of the pandemic. I mean, the USDA changed their guidelines for feeding, which I know you know. So, but you know, most pediatricians and family docs and even nutritionists in some ways are, we're all catching up. But in that, it was the very first time that they said babies, right from the very beginning at four to six months of age, should eat all complementary and common allergens in the diet routinely. So it, of course, is not just peanut. It's peanut, tree nuts, soy, egg, wheat. And and one thing that your listeners, this is, you know, Dr. Nadeau, who, who you know, from Stanford taught me is that I was like, why is peanut the most common allergy? Why are tree nuts? Well, what is it? Well, they're really stable proteins. And so there is a reason why nuts are the most common and fish, et cetera. And it's that the protein that talks to the immune system is attached to fat. So think about allergens. They're actually fatty foods in general. And, and it makes them very stable in the environment. And so if your skin barrier is open and that's a stable food in the environment, it's always around. So kids were definitely getting exposed to peanut in the environment, like baseball games. Like think of how we used to put airplanes, like grocery stores, you know, snack foods, et cetera. Peanuts are everywhere because that peanut protein that talks to the immune system sitting right next to a big hunk of fat, that peanut dust will sit on a countertop and stay there really stable. And then somebody's got it on their hand. They pick up a baby with eczema and it goes right into that baby's skin and the baby's exposed. And that's the same with all the other common allergens. Those are typically nuts and seeds and foods and, and in animals, right? When it comes to shellfish or fish, you know, those are the kind of foods that when they're in an environment, those proteins are stable. And so then we're exposed to them. And I think that's the thing that makes me even suspicious. You know, shrimp, for example, is the number one food allergy in adulthood. I'm like, shrimp's not everywhere, even in American culture, but in America, it's the number one food allergy in adulthood. But that makes me think, oh, it's just such a stable protein. If I go to a restaurant and I don't even eat shrimp, I probably, if, if I've got a rash on my arm, I probably do get a little bit exposed to shrimp. It's probably fine. My immune system may not sensitize to that, but it does increase my interest in in my barrier, you know, in that skin barrier again too. So, so I think the other wow. thing is that from the year 2015 until now, fast forward six years, you and I and all sorts of other pediatricians and nutritionists and family doctors are trying to make sense of all this guideline change, trying to make sense of the science that guided it, and trying to even make sense in the slowness of how the societies get to the final decisions to say exactly what to do. But the USDA is saying a food is a food is a food as it talks to the immune system. And we know that the more diet diversity, your baby, your toddler, your partner, your mother, your grandmother gets, the better. In that like putting a kid in the dirt and letting him play in the dirt versus growing up in the middle of New York City, that there's something about that biodiversity that is likely very stabilizing to the immune system. A study by Dr. Karina Venter, who's a PhD nutritionist at University of Colorado, published in 2020, found that babies with great diet diversity at six months of age were 90% less likely to develop a food allergy than kids who didn't have diet diversity at six months. It's an amazing study because she followed those kids until they were 10. But that just means you're eating a lot of different foods routinely. So make it up. But it's, it's just, what's so hard is that if you go to Target or you go to Walmart or you go um, to the grocery and you buy baby food, 95% of American parents buy commercially prepared baby food. None of these ingredients are in the baby food. So the USDA just made this big guideline shift. It's like, eat all these foods in early life. And then mom and dad go and buy food at grocery. And they don't have any of these allergens in it. So mom and dad have to do it themselves, right? Yeah. And 
you know, I was a full-time pedi- practicing pediatrician when I had my first son. I was then starting even my career in media when I had my second. And I didn't make all my own baby food. I made some of my baby food, but I bought commercially, uh, you know, baby food. And I don't want anyone to ever feel bad about that. I think there's great commercially available food. But the really tall task today is that parents then have to constantly think of like, how am I introducing the stuff I'm eating and loving in my culture, in my family, and maybe even things I don't eat, right, into my baby and toddler's diet early in life when their immune system is learning through that critical window of time? Because I think a question that we get, and I bet your listeners, you know, if you're a vegetarian or you're vegan, are you raising your child vegetarian or vegan? That's up to you, right? It can be harder to do. It's certainly possible. And yet... I'm, I'm here to say that I think if you're willing to think about um, the very unique time in life that is early life, that exposing your child to more diversity that might include food proteins that come from animals, fish or shellfish in particular, because of their likelihood to cause allergic disease, I think it's likely in your child's best interest. And how you do that is up to you. But routinely and repeatedly feeding those kinds of proteins, I think, are important. For, so with Spoonful One, for example, right, the solution we have for babies, it's 16 foods that represent the top foods that cause 90% of food allergies. So it includes fish and co- you know salmon and cod. It includes shrimp. It includes all the tree nuts. It includes peanuts, soy, sesame, wheat, you know, um, egg, dairy, all, all the ones that are the kind of common players. And some families will say, well, we're vegetarian. We're raising our child vegetarian. And I'll say, well, if you believe Dr. Nadeau and you believe all the science from around the world, if you can feed even just 30 milligrams is what's included in food mm-hmm. for one every day, your child's body is getting exposed to that food protein in a way where the immune system can see it and blow it off, right? As opposed to sensitizing to it because you're not eating it, but it's in the environment they're getting exposed in their skin, right? Um, I highly recommend it. So, you know, I think there are some times that we make compromises to hard and fast rules because of unique circumstances. And this is one where as a pediatrician and someone who believes so wholeheartedly in prevention efforts that there's something about the immune system in early life that's really open to learning. It's like how when you're raising a bilingual child, right? Like, Kids can learn like three languages, four languages at once until they're like seven. And then the brain just gets a little like inelastic, right? And if I go to try, if I go to try to learn, you know, French next year, it's going to be really hard. But if I have a six-year-old sitting next to me, she'll just pop that French right into her brain. And the same thing is true about the immune system, that there's something about infancy, toddlerhood, probably in preschool years where the immune system in the gut is really learning about foods in a unique way. And you just want to, you want to capitalize on it as a parent. Yeah. No. And that diversity, you know, you keep saying the word diversity. It is so important for other things too. I mean, our gut microbiome, we're learning more and more about how our gut microbiome supports health, decreases our risk of inflammatory bowel disease, decreases the risk of other autoimmune diseases. So diversity is key. And this is what I'm learning over and over again from experts in different fields is that food diversity is key. In your case, particularly, you're passionate about preventing food allergies, but it'll be a win-win-win situation because we're also decreasing a risk of other potentially chronic conditions. One thing I want to point out though, when it comes to the world of plants, there's over 50,000 plants that are edible. So when it comes to diversity, still focusing on getting as many plants as possible is also, I think, a great idea. We know that in the United States, we are exposed to a lot of animal proteins because that's our culture. So we're going to be exposed to these animal foods. And when it comes to parents, when I talk to them, you know, developing a food allergy changes your entire life. It increases anxiety, it increases stress, it increases the risk of death, accidental death. So it's a big deal, you know? We do wanna consider, even if you're vegan, even if you're vegetarian, do you want to decrease your child's risk of developing an allergy that could potentially lead to anaphylaxis, could change your entire lifestyle? And so this is what I'm posing to parents, for them to just consider. And if you don't wanna be bringing those animal products into your house, then these types of products could be a good solution Mm -hmm. for the families that want to expose their little ones for a few years, but don't necessarily want to have to bring it into the house for them to cook themselves. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I love that. I mean, I think we we always have to make compromises when we're raising a child. (laughs) That's like the understatement of the year for every parent. And I think, 
you know, having just like bathed in this data and with all these experts from around the world, you know, we partner, um, we're launching in China and Japan and Australia and the United Kingdom and all, you know, I, I have been, I've been so fortunate to meet Dr. Gideon Lack and to meet Michael Perkins who published the EAT study and to, you know, I, I, I get exposed to the, and no one's got questions, you know, about diet different. People know that there's something unique about early life. And so, as you're thinking about how do I how do I do this as best I can as a parent, like I, I deeply want to respect people's cultural instincts, the, the, the importance of their culture and their family tradition, and some of the principles that some people will hold against. To your point, animal products, etc., and, and what has happened here in the United States with our overconsumption, right, of yeah. animal products in general, and frankly, the overuse of antimicrobials. I mean, fifty percent, mm-hmm. right, of of antibiotics that are used are used to raise animals for eating, right? I mean, it's horrible horrible for our environment in that sense that the, you know that when we know that 50% of antibiotics are also unnecessary right so you get to this like we're changing the world we're making it l- less diverse in an, in a quote natural way so i think yes um you know there are, are there are some compromises but i just want like as cl- crisp advice as i can give i, I think it's in your the, the data around peanut and egg is the most convincing from around the world that being said as you talk to immunologists there's nothing different about a food protein from, you know, from a, a walnut versus a peanut at how it talks to the immune system. So that's why I, I believe so wholeheartedly that the more different food that you can get, diet diversity, like what we're calling, every day of your child's life, the, the benefit I think it can be tan- is tantamount to kind of some of those principles in a certain period of time. It might be that you say, yeah, we don't exactly know if it's when a child's six months or 18 months or three and a half when it's most important. But maybe you say, well, until they're four, I'm going to use these products or I'm going to try to get these into the, my child's diet when we're out and about. Maybe I don't bring them in my home, but so that they're exposed to them when their immune system is really open <laughs> and, and learning. And then you might make a different decision thereafter, right? Because yeah. that, that's probably the most important time as we understand it from the data around the world. But nobody really knows yet. And so you're yeah. we're kind of on that leading edge of that. And I think just con- to consider it, I, th- I think, is a really mm-hmm. a smart way. And, and, you know, a spoonful one, you know, we we have a mix in which you, you can dump into a, a pureed baby food or you can bake it into a little pancake or we have little puffs that a baby can eat. And it is precisely measured. I mean, it is based on Dr. Nadeau's data from Stanford to say it's 30 milligrams of each of these 16 foods every single day so that the immune system sees it every day. We don't want to take up over a meal. We never would want to interfere with breastfeeding. I mean, you just kind of want to keep your natural diet. And, you know, we want all these foods to be brought to the table. To your point, if there's, I mean, whoa, 50,000 different vegetables, <laughs> fruits, whatever whatever plants to eat plants yeah yeah mm-hmm. plants yeah and i think you know if you can eat all those different kinds of plants i mean re- recognizing not everyone's going to get that but i love the i love some of the new thinking of like when you're starting foods you don't need to go slow in fact if you do you know you, you likely will increase risk there's a study called the child study that was that was that was conducted in canada and it looked at well babies not babies at risk but ba- well babies and they found that in the families that waited to introduce peanut for example until the baby was a year the child had a fourfold increased risk of developing a food allergy. In the parents and families that waited until a baby was 18 months to introduce peanut, the risk was seven times that of a child who had it early. So we know that if you go slow and you don't get all these foods in, your child's risk to their sensitizing to them just increases. They're just alive longer on the planet. They could be exposed to it probably through their skin. You know, what Dr. Gideon Lack described is called the dual allergen exposure hypothesis. But I think that... Um, the practicality is why Dr. Nadeau created the company in the first place. It was to translate this data, to have someone like me come as a pediatrician and just try to kind of teach and help people understand it. But it was also convenience. It was like, we know that you know only 40% of the families in the EAT trial could even get five foods in their baby's diet regularly. And they were in a research protocol that was telling them exactly how to do it. So it's just the practicality of saying, of course you can do this with whole food. Of course you can go to the grocery and mix it all up and put it in different foods and different meals. And in fact, I want you to do that. That The flavor palette is more open in a child between four to seven months of age than any other time. So you want like bitter and you want naturally savory things and you want naturally sweet things. We never want to add salt. We never need to add spice. We never, because babies have, you know, three times the amount of taste buds that you and I do as we get older. But I think that... Um, you know, I think Spoonful One is there not because you need to buy another product. Like I, I, but at the same time, you do if you don't think you're going to get all these foods in your baby's diet every day. 
you know, I mean, yeah. or, it, you know, it, or every week. I mean, even how you look at it, are you going to get all these different food groups in your baby's diet? It's not in the baby food. So, you know, we don't have baby food products that have all of it. We have Bomba that you can buy now that doesn't have any sugar in it, but that's just peanut. And peanut's not hard. I mean, you can take some peanut butter, some natural peanut butter and, and dilute it down and mix it in some oatmeal and you're done. Great. Yeah. But how are you going to get all those other foods in regularly? And it isn't just trying it once, right? It is that diet diversity kind of every day from an immune standpoint that I think, you know, I think 20 years from now, this will, baby foods will be full of these ingredients. And, mm -hmm. and I believe, you know, all the work that I've done in prevention and for on the side of kind of vaccines. And as you know, you know, I had a podcast, I wrote a blog for 10 years. I was the first pediatrician blogger in a hospital in this country. Like I've reached millions and millions of people. And I, sometimes I think, if I can really just help change the food source in babies around the world and here in the United States, that might be some of the most important work that I do because having a food allergy, as you described, is is not a fun thing. It changes your every single day and it changes the every single day of the people that you live with and the people around you. And it's hard and it can be scary. I mean, yes. thankfully, accidental you know ingestions that lead to life-threatening anaphylaxis are rare. They're as rare as a lightning strike. And yet... You know, we know every three minutes somebody lands in an emergency room in this country after an accidental ingestion of a food for support and help after anaphylaxis. So it's it's a big, Absolutely. it's a multi billion dollar tax on our health system too. So yes, oh, and just the anxiety as a mother, as a yeah. child, you know, just always having that anxiety that something could happen when you travel. Those kinds of things it does change your entire life. Yeah. Well, talk to me about the introduction the timing of introduction yeah. because right now I'm seeing this huge divide which absolutely I know you are too I'm a huge proponent for breastfeeding and supporting breastfeeding as long as we can get there and there's this belief that even if the child is showing readiness to eat if you're exclusively breastfeeding you should not give that baby anything but breast milk until they're over six months yeah let, let me let I, i'm ready. so talk to yeah. me about this I'm because so i feel like yeah. especially online it's like rah, yeah, rah, rah. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> you, know? you know i was just saying to somebody who's talking i mean you know they're like these mommy wars online and like you know yes whoever is listening i guarantee they've already made their decision if they're breastfeeding or if they're supplementing with additional formula or not right or they're using formula like They've already made a decision by the time they're listening to this. And so all the breastfeeding propaganda at some point can be, feel very shameful. It can feel very, mm -hmm. very difficult. And I'll tell you, as a mom who landed, I landed myself in the hospital when my first son was four months of age with severe mastitis that caused an abscess and mm -hmm. caused significant infection and wasn't able to my breastfeed goodness. him as long as I wanted. All the propaganda that came after that for me was upsetting, right? On some level, like I tried, I wanted, I was a pediatrician, like I knew the science and I couldn't, I couldn't do it. My, my case is unusual and rare. And yet it, it helped me see how devastating and the, the burden it can feel to moms who have made a different decision and families who've made a different decision. So I don't, I don't want to get in that, but I do think it gets, you know, the lactation community to their credit has been in, fighting an uphill battle against big food industry and all these different things that have, I think tried to take away that the ability, like breast milk is incredible, right? It's like a perfect food that has immune support and it it's great and healthy for mom and it's amazing bonding experience with baby, et cetera. And most people, 90% who want to breastfeed their child will, right? That's what's great. But people make different decisions for all different kinds of reasons as well. And I believe that every woman and or man raising a child gets to have the decision to feed, and especially as non-traditional families increase in, in numbers. It's not, it's not always going to be the situation. But, you know, I think that um, timing is really important. And yet, so the hard and fast thing, you know, the WHO, for example, around the world will say exclusive breastfeeding to age six months. And then here in the United States, you know, the guidelines are wishy-washy around it, but it's some around the age of four to six months, you should be breastfeeding. And the lactation consultant will say exclusive until six months. Well, we know there was data, I think, published in 2013 in, in pediatrics that said you never want to start complementary and solid food before four months. We know mm -hmm. that that's probably calories in a way and calorie density in a different way that can lead to the risk of overweight in a child. And there's no need, right? You don't need complementary foods. And babies usually aren't don't have developmental readiness. It's my belief that this is always going to be a joint decision between baby and parent. And, and it comes from different things. So there's developmental readiness of your baby needs to have good head control. They need to have good trunk support. They don't have to sit independently. They need to be able to sit though on your lap so that when the involuntary swallow reflex starts, right, they can protect their airway and, and have a good experience. They need to show emotional readiness. Like they need to watch you when you're eating. Like I love that babies will sometimes like lick the air. You know, they're like, 
what is that that you're eating? It smells delicious. Like your hummus smells <laughs> delicious, you know, like they're cued into something happening, right? And once I show you all of that, then if you're ready to, then it's a really great time to say, well, I'm the provider of my child's food source. Like I get to decide how, you know, what they get to choose from and then they get to decide if they want to eat it and how much, you know, like, you know, Ellen Satter, like kind of goddess mm -hmm. of pediatric nutrition. I, I loved her division of responsibility, which is parents' job is to buy good food and offer it. Kids' job is to decide which of those foods they like and how much they want to eat, right? And that's that. That's why no clean plate club, none of that junk, right? Where you're like forcing some sort of other idea on a kid. But so I want babies and parents together to say, it's Tuesday. My kid has got these developmental milestones. I want to do solid foods for the first time today, baby led weaning or not. My baby's ready to do it. They've got to grasp or they don't. Or I'm going to give them a period food. Great. Hallelujah. You can do whatever food you want. And that your baby might be four months old. Your baby might be five months old. Your baby might be six months old. I don't think that first day matters that much. But if baby's ready and mom and dad are ready, that's the right time, you know? And mm -hmm. then I think it's, I love this advice around like, then I want you to do like 100 new foods in 100 days. I do not want you to go slow. There is not a single study that says you need to wait three days between introductions. So if you introduce avocado at breakfast and after two hours, if there's no reaction to, from your child to avocado that makes you concerned about a food allergy, you can introduce another food. Anaphylaxis, right, or anything, the common, most common side effects or signs of an allergic reaction in infants and toddlers, by and large, the far majority are not life-threatening anaphylaxis. We don't, thank goodness, we don't see that in children and toddlers or infants and toddlers. What we see is hives and vomiting. So if your child developed hives or your child vomited repeatedly or even once immediately after feeding, you might be like, was that that food? And if you fed it again and the kid vomited right away, you'd say, I'm not gonna feed my kid that food again for a while until I talk to my child's pediatrician. So, but that first day comes somewhere, four, five, six months, and you might wanna feed your baby once a day solid foods and offer them. You might want to feed your baby complimentary solid foods twice or three times a day because every time you as a family sit down to eat, that is completely up to you and your baby. And your baby will self-regulate how much she wants of it and when to stop and which ones she wants and which ones she doesn't, right? But your job is to be the division of responsibility, right? Your job is you're the provider of great food. And when you're the provider of great food, now what we know with modern medicine and modern science is that you have to provide a really diverse food source. So I don't care when it is. I do not believe from 12 years of pediatric practice, I do not believe that if your baby shows readiness at four and a half months and she's eager, or he's eager to eat and you want to give some solid food, it certainly doesn't ever need to be rice cereal. In fact, you know, with all the arsenic that we have found because of groundwater sources where we grow rice, I don't actually want babies really to have rice. I want them to have different kinds of grains and different cereals and different fruits and different veggies and different ground up meat. If you're someone who does eat meat in your diet, it's etc. But I, you know, I think that whenever that happens, that's great. And you and your baby will regulate how much nursing or breastfeeding and or how much supplemental formula, if you use formula that your baby will eat, but leaving it up to your baby to decide when and how much and what is great because that's how to teach a child to know and love food. It's how to teach a child to know and love how to eat and feel satiety and stop. Um, but I think when you get started, what you need to know based on USDA guidelines and all the stuff we've been talking about is the day you start, then you can't go slow. It's one thing you mm -hmm. can't do because if you do my, my risk, my, the risk is you're going to be like those kids in Canada that didn't get peanut till they were 12 months of age and they were four times more likely to develop an allergy to it. So you have to be intentional about yes. introducing new things all the time and then keeping them in your diet. And you can do that by sharing mm -hmm. your own foods in a, you know, age appropriate um, texture, right, and volume. Mm -hmm. And you can also do it by thinking like, okay, we're going to do all the tree nuts or we're going to do peanut and then we're going to do egg and we're going to get wheat in and we're going to use different kinds of grains when we feed cereal. And yeah, maybe we're vegan and we don't eat a lot of eggs in our house, but we're going to let our baby have some scrambled eggs here and there. Or I'm going to bake egg into um, a little pancake that I make for my child because I want my child's immune system to see and know that. And I think, mm -hmm. but it's it's that intention that you have to take. And, and with Spoonful One, there's nothing mad. I mean, there's nothing magic about spoonful one. It's just a convenience to say, here's all the foods that we want your baby to have in early life repeatedly, and you can dump that into whatever you want. It's organic, right? It's local. It's sourced from all over the world, from reputable places, and it's and it's checked, of course, for contamination and and bio burden, like meaning that it can't be contaminated with bacteria, and it's checked for heavy metals, like we want all baby food to be tested for, which FDA, as you know, has just has regulated in different ways that within the last year, even. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. No, I completely agree. And I also agree that as far as my families and what I have noticed is that 
even for the exclusively breastfed babies, introducing complementary foods before six months doesn't change the path that the mom's already on. It's not like she starts giving complementary foods and she's like, oh, I'm going to quit breastfeeding yeah, now that they're eating. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I agree with that is that the baby should have signs of readiness just because it's safe and we know that developmentally ready to take it. But if it's if they're under six months and they're ready to go, it's fine to go. You don't have to wait for this magical must be six months to start if the baby's ready before then. Yeah, and I think, you know, WHO does that because around the world they're trying to protect that, right? And yet yes. that, that's why I say it's when mom and or dad and baby is both ready. If mom is not yes. ready to give up exclusive breastfeeding, then they're not ready. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, it's this funny thing. It's like baby shows readiness. Mom's got to show readiness too if she's nursing. And if she's not ready to give up exclusive breastfeeding, it's okay. She needs to supplement with vitamin D and she needs to supplement with iron after four months. That's it. Yeah. And she's, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Right. Yep. No harm there. But, but that would just mean that mom's not ready. Right. So if mm -hmm. both are ready, then they're good to go. And I just don't think we have a lot of data to say if your baby shows readiness at five months and you're ready and you're nursing that you're going to cause any harm. We don't have data right. that shows that. And to your point, moms aren't going to stop. I mean, let's give moms more credit than, oh, yeah, you started feeding cereals and fruits and, and veggies and common allergens when your baby's five months and what, and then you didn't breastfeed? I mean, baby won't fill up on complementary foods so mm -hmm. much, right, that their desire and their, you know, their demand for breast milk is going to change even mom's supply. And or mom, yeah. you know, mom, mom can hand pump or, or pump if she, I mean, we don't see moms needing to do that, though. I mean, you know that. In right. practice, we just don't. Yes, it works out. It works, <laughs> it works out. out. But yeah, I think it's true. It's just it kind so of challenging the dogma and challenging this, like it has to be this way when moms and babies are ready beforehand, I think is just important to hear from you. So thank you so much for that. I'm going to throw in another question real quick because this comes up too. For moms that are breastfeeding, does what the mom consumes while she's breastfeeding yes. or while she's pregnant mm -hmm. affect the rate of development of food allergies for children? Yeah, such a good question. I'm so glad you brought it up. Thank you. So first and foremost, you know, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, ACOG, says don't, don't restrict your diet during pregnancy. Now, we know, of course, moms stay away from stuff that could be contaminated with bacteria, like, mm -hmm. you know, cold cuts if you're eating meat or, um, you know, different cheeses, for example, if you eat cheese and or, you know, fish from a standpoint of kind of mercury levels, et cetera. You minimize those things. But we don't want you to not have them at all. In fact, diet diversity in pregnancy is good for fetal development and outcomes when it comes to food allergies. But there isn't data that says you eat a really diverse diet when you're pregnant and then your baby won't get food allergies. Unfortunately, we don't have that data, but we do know that you don't want to restrict your diet during pregnancy. Now, mm -hmm. the game changes after baby's born and baby's getting food themselves. So we know that, unfortunately, singularly, breastfeeding alone will not protect your child against the development of food allergy, which doesn't, it, it intuitively, I don't like it. Like, you know, you have to dig into it. And Dr. Venter, the one I mentioned at University of Colorado, has studied this quite a bit, that unfortunately, you know, the amount of, if I eat um, a tuna salad sandwich and I have a peanut butter toast on the side and I get all my allergens in and then I nurse my baby. The amount, babies are going to get little pieces of all of that, right? That's what's kind of amazing about breast milk, but likely not in quantities that kind of talk to the immune system in the way that we know complementary foods ultimately will once baby starts. Mm -hmm. So we do know a couple things though. Breastfeeding your baby in the first three months of life, and this was published in the American Academy of Pediatrics Clinical Report in April of 2019. But breastfeeding your baby in the first three months of life decreases their risk of eczema, right? That's great, right? We don't want eczema because we know eczema is a risk factor for developing food allergies. So indirectly, breastfeeding decreases eczema, likely then decreases the likelihood your child's going to develop a food allergy. So great. Of course, we want you to breastfeed if you can or if you want to. Now, unfortunately, though, if you just keep breastfeeding, you don't see that ongoing data reflected in studies that after three months of age, you don't see a protective effect indirectly even or directly when it comes to the development of food allergy. And that's probably because of the amount of protein a child gets. So the, the number one thing that the clinical report says is don't delay the introduction. There's no evidence evidence that delaying things like peanut or egg or tree nut or fish or shellfish is good for a child. And even though we mm -hmm. don't in America typically think of putting fish in our baby and toddler's diet or shrimp in our baby and toddler's diet, there's no data that not doing it. And now the USDA is saying, get them all in right from the start. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think breast milk is protective against a lot of things. I mean, even when we, you know, pre-pandemic even, there was an outbreak in 2015, for example, of measles all over the United States. 
if you guys remember, it stemmed from the Disneyland exposure. And then, for example, there was a mm-hmm. kinder care in Chicago that had an outbreak. And there was a big mommy war online about, oh, if you had just breastfed, you know, blah, blah, blah. But when you look at it, actually, even at four months of age, the amount of maternal antibodies that mom passes through breast milk for measles is unfortunately not even protective for a newborn. So it's good. The immunolog- the, there's support there, but you still want to get your baby immunized, right? At a year, for example, we do measles at a year of age. And actually, if you, at, during the time of measles outbreaks, and even still, if you travel internationally, we say immunize your baby for measles starting at six months. So, I mean, I think that um, it's there. It's like all that food is there. If you're like a perfect eater and you eat all this great diverse food and you're breastfeeding your baby, great. You're going to downregulate the likelihood of, of eczema. But unfortunately, we do not have data and research studies that shows that you will protect against the development of food allergies. So breastfeed your baby. Then when you and baby are both ready and you start complementary foods, we know don't delay. Get all those foods in as early as you can and keep them in. I love it. Great message. Okay, so last question. And you've already talked about some of these things. So maybe you just summarize it quickly. Besides the introducing the allergens early and consistently, what else can parents do to decrease the risk of development of the food allergies? Yeah, thank you. So first and foremost, no, we can't probably get rid of all food allergies. So if you're a parent out there who has a child with food allergies, I want to be crystal clear that you didn't likely do anything wrong. (laughs) You know, food allergies develop from multifactorial reasons, right? Mm -hmm. Probably a mix of genetics, right? We know that um, two out of three kids in the United States with a food allergy don't have a parent with a food allergy, but one in three do, right? So there is Mm -hmm. a genetic component in some ways. But first and foremost, you want to take care of that skin barrier that we talked about. So if your baby has dry skin or a rash, like 20% of babies have eczema, you want to take care of that work with your pediatrician or family practitioner, nurse practitioner on how do you keep good emollients? How do you not use a lot of soaps? And then how do, if sometimes you need a topical steroid, for example, to use on that skin, you do that. Second, you get these foods in early. Right, You support your baby by using supplemental vitamin D as is recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics right from the get-go. And then when you start feeding complementary foods, you don't just eat them once. You eat them and then you keep them in your baby's diet. Either you do that with whole food or you buy something like Spoonful One where you add it to your baby's diet on a daily or every other day basis to make sure that they're getting that diet diversity. And then you just don't go slow and you keep them in. That the more diverse diet, the more you show and bring these foods to your child's table, the more flavors they're encouraged to eat and the more that they will gradually self-feed them themselves. And then you just keep them in the diet. I mean, those are the number one, two, three things that we can do. Vitamin D from the beginning, diet diversity, let your kids play outside and keep kind of keeping all those exposures in their life as they grow and develop. And you can downregulate the likelihood of them developing a food allergy. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Well, let me ask you about you a little bit. What personal habit are you most proud of and why? Oh gosh, I should have pre-read your question. Yeah. Um, my per- mm-hmm. personal habit. I think, um, I think it's my practice of friendship. <laughs> Um, Uh I have amazing friends and I don't think it's just luck. (laughs) That's awesome. Well, what do you think it is? What kind of things do you do to be such a great friend? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's longstanding making time to have, to build friendship, to listen to our friends and, and know what's going on in their life, reflect and, and respond to them, make and plan time to be with them. Um, and to nurture friendships throughout our lives that, you know, we know that living a solitary life leads to a shorter life. And it's, you know, when we're raising our families and, you know, I've been working full time my entire life, that it can be really difficult to nurture friendships outside of just our immediate nuclear family. Yes. Um, but that's a habit that from, you know, I use an app called Marco Polo with some of my girlfriends from college. We, we talk almost every single day and some of my friends from high school, um, you know, I, I connect in text messages and then a plan visit. I actually just uh, this morning drove um, our friends away. Three of my college girlfriends were here for two days and we do it every single summer. And it's like, you know, things are crazy in our lives. We have a rate partners when we leave our kids and uproot for two days, but <laughs> um, I, I think we can, and I learn. All, I mean, I even learn how to eat differently because of my. Even this weekend, I learned how to eat differently because of one of my friends. I mean, I think we um, sleep differently. How, how they meditate, like how they think about it. How are they thinking about how they spend their summers with their kids? How are they blah 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 blah. But I mean, w- surrounding ourselves with a, a either a very small or a large group of, of meaningful, intense relationships, I think, is um, a habit worth worth practicing. Oh, that's that's amazing. I love it, and that's so admirable. 
I agree that in this day and age, especially with busy professional women, it's hard to nurture relationships mm -hmm. sometimes, especially when you have kids and all kinds of schedules. So that's so cool that you were able to maintain that. And that definitely inspires me. So thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, thank you. Well, I'd love to know what your favorite vegetable is and method of preparation. Well, I have to tell you, it changes. So, but I want to say I started during the pandemic, my very first vegetable garden, and it's about like 20 mm. feet by 14 feet. And I now have started referring to it as my farm. So my favorite <laughs> vegetable is usually whatever's ready in the farm. And this week, um, truly, my favorite vegetable is zucchini because I'm not kidding you. I'm growing these. I'm showing her. I'm showing Dr. Yami with my hands. I mean, you guys can't see me, but. I literally am growing these like five pound giant zucchinis and I'm cutting them up and throwing them on the grill with olive oil and it is amazing. So, but I'll yeah. say usually it's actually a fruit. A tomato is always my favorite. I will put it in gazpacho. I will put it on a bagel. I will put it with eggs. I will put it, um, I will eat them straight. I will eat it straight with um, just like, um, like Malden uh, salt flakes, which are my favorite, or smoky Alderwood smoked salt, which is from the Pacific Northwest, which I love. On a even a, a tomato that is not fully ripe, if you put a little smoky salt on it, it is like mm, delicious. But this week, it's zucchini. Yeah. Well, and those homegrown tomatoes yeah. are on a um, different yeah. level. Yeah. You know, it's not the same as what you get at the store. Not so yeah, they're all. just so delightful. Yeah. And it's hard Wonderful. to grow them in some parts of the country. I mean, now that I, I moved from Seattle to Madison, Wisconsin, and I, I, you know, I have a really full facing sun garden and it's hot here. And so you can like basil and tomatoes just go like crazy and yes. zucchinis, it turns out. But yeah. Yo, congratulations. That's so Thanks. awesome. Yeah, I'm learning so much about vegetables, actually. I, I, I love it. I love it. I grow lots That's of That's great. That makes me super, super happy. Yeah. Okay. So where can listeners connect with you? And you've talked about Spoonful One. Mm -hmm. How can they find that and the products and, and those kinds of things? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, well, let me first talk about Spoonful One, then you can talk about me. Spoonful One is probably more worth your while than finding just me. But the um, Spoonful One is now, we just launched in Target. So we're all over the United States and we're at Target.com. But you can also, um, so you can go to, you know, we're just starting in different Targets around the country. But you can go online and get it. You can get it at Amazon or you can go to SpoonfulOne.com. So it's just Spoonful and then O-N-E. Dot com And all the science that I've talked about today is linked there and explained. You'll see me all over it. If you want to make a food introduction plan, we just launched a tool that basically takes and asks you a series of like 15 questions to kind of guide like, where are you? How are you feeding your baby? What's your baby's risk factors? Do they have eczema? Do you have a family history? How comfortable do you feel feeding egg or peanut, et cetera? And then we make um, you know, an introductory plan. And some of those plans include like every single allergen one at a time. Some are just a few allergens and then moving to something like Spoonful One with diet diversity. And some are just dump Spoonful One in and keep all these. And we give you whole food recipes to do that. So check that out if that would be helpful for like if you don't exactly know how to get it all done and get those foods in kind of quickly and keep them in, um, we just devised that. And then me, I don't know. I'm at wendysuswanson.com, and that includes all the blogs that I wrote when I was at Seattle Children's Hospital as Seattle Mama Doc for 10 years. And it also is just, I'm there. I'm not writing a lot there, but I'm there. And then I'm on Instagram, which is probably the place I share mostly only in stories, but I'm usually there every day. And that's just uh, Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson. And then on Twitter, the well, kind of largest following I have is Twitter, and I'm just Wendy Sue Swanson. So Great. I used well, to be Seattle I'm Mama sure Doc, that when I left Seattle, I had to... I had to genericize myself with my, my name. Because <laughs> you're not in Seattle yeah, anymore, right. so you can't be Seattle uh, anymore. No. That's great. Yeah. Well, so much there to explore, and you have so much wisdom and so much experience and so much passion, so I'm super grateful that you were able to come and give me some of your time so that my listeners can benefit from this. I would love it if you leave me with one last message for parents. What message do you want parents to have about feeding their children? Well, I want, I want this. I want you to know that you get to enjoy it. I think there are just a couple things in life that are um, kind of transcendent. I think one is when our, our children are healthy and sleeping comfortably and we watch them sleep. I think it's one of the most peaceful, angelic things that we can witness. Um, and then secondarily, it's like nourishing our children. So I want families to feel calm I want them to be confident that they know, in this case, the science, but I really want you to give yourself permission to enjoy it. There aren't that many rules. You know, you don't have, I mean, there aren't that many don'ts and there are some do's, but I just want you to give yourself the credit to like forgive yourself in advance and then enjoy feeding your children. Because if you do, 
your children will enjoy eating. And if you eat in, in a smart way, and, and not always, right? If you don't forbid anything, but if you enjoy food, you will share that love of food with your children. And don't hold yourself back for that. I think, I think that's yes. it. Ah, so beautiful, so compassionate. Dr. Swanson, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate you so much. Thank you for your passion, all the work that you're doing in this very important area. And I hope that you have a very plantastic day. <laughs> well, I'm grateful to you for having me here. And I um, am grateful to you um, for what I'm learning from you too. So thank you so much. Hey, veggie lover. I hope that you loved today's episode. Will you take a second and do me a huge favor? Please subscribe to my podcast so that you never miss an episode. You're the reason I'm here and I want to share it all with you. Thank you for listening and have a plantastic day.